Hi friends, uh, once again, uh, welcome back to the nurse channel and the timings of the examination and the center will be notified to you uh, through their website or through your mail and uh, text messages. So who are applied for the post kindly uh, go through your mail and uh, your text messages for the updates. So uh, as you all know that uh, keeping this NIMHANS recruitment examination in mind, we have already started a series known as the NIMHANS series and this is the sixth video. and. Uh, uh, whoever watched our earlier videos know that we are including 15 very very important questions which are uh, NIMHANS based questions like we are giving much priority for the uh, neurological questions and psychiatric questions along with that other questions which are taken from uh, other aspects of nursing subjects okay so uh, uh, this is the sixth series and uh, I request everyone who are watching this video to watch the video till the end because the explanations are very 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 important okay so whoever not yet subscribed kindly subscribe our channel and support us and enable the bell icon so that you will be notified whenever new videos are uploaded so without losing time we will be moving on to the next series and uh, kindly share about this platform to your nursing friend and uh, if you want any clarification or any uh, notes regarding any uh, additional information regarding any subjects kindly let us know through your comments and feedbacks so without losing time we will be moving on to the sixth series of nimhan series questions so here comes the questions for you here comes your first question uh, in this nimhan series so the question is on the screen right now so the question is which among the following is a first line treatment of heart failure which decreases the workload of the heart and allows the kidney to secrete sodium so this question is regarding a drug and that drug is used as a first line treatment for heart failure and its another actions are it will decrease the workload of the heart and it will allow the kidney to secrete sodium so okay these are the functions of that particular drug so which is that drug that is a question so the options are option number a beta blockers option number b vasodilators option number c angiotensin 2 receptor blockers and option number d angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors so what is the answer first line treatment in uh, heart failure work reduces workload and third one is uh, secret sodium so the answer is option number D that is angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors, ACE inhibitors. Okay, so we'll have a small uh, explanation regarding this question. So we know that angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors are a class of medications which are used primarily for high blood pressure and heart failure, especially left ventricular systolic dysfunction. Okay, left ventricular heart failure and for hypertension. So this class of medicines work by causing relaxation of blood vessels as well as a decrease in the blood volume. Which which leads to lower the blood pressure and decreased oxygen demand from the heart okay so these are the class of medicines which are working by relaxation of blood vessels so and there is a decrease in the blood volume also which leads to lower the blood pressure and decreased oxygen consumption from the demand from the heart okay so the first option that is a uh, uh, workload of the heart will be reduced okay so ACE inhibitors have also been shown to cause a central enhancement of parasympathetic nervous system activity also reduces the plasma norepinephrine level and uh, resulting vasoconstriction effects in the heart failure patients thus breaking the vicious circles of sympathetic and renin angiotensin system activation okay so these are the this is the another <coughs> uh, action of ace inhibitors that means it has a central enhancement of parasympathetic nervous system activity and it reduces the plasma norepinephrine levels also and it can result in the vasoconstriction effect which will help in the heart failure patients and thus it will break the vicious circle of sympathetic and renin angiotensin activation system okay the ras and all we have explained uh, several times in our previous videos you can go through that videos so the examples of ace inhibitors are ranipril enlapril captopril etc etc okay so the first question regarding the uh, from the central nervous system and heart failure uh, i think it, we go you got the point so we will discuss about the other options also so angiotensin 2 is a potent vasoconstrictor that also causes the increased aldosterone secretion so aldosterone is responsible for sodium and water retention okay so the ace inhibitors interfere with the conversion of angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2 and therefore causes the vasodilation as well as the loss of sodium and water okay so this mechanism you know very well okay so that's all regarding the first question now we will be moving on to the second question in the series so the question is which of the following complications 
is indicated by a, a third heart sound okay so which of the following complications is indicated by a third heart sound so this is regarding s3 heart sound so the options are option number a ventricular dilation option number b systemic hypertension option number c aortic valve malformation and option number d increased atrial contraction in among these options in which condition you can hear a third heart sound or s3 so what is the answer so answer for this question is option number a that is ventricular dilation okay ventricular dilation so the options we will be discussing now so the third heart sounds that is the s3 it is a low frequency brief vibration occurring in the early diastole at the end of rapid diastolic filling period of the right or left ventricle so this is the time where third heart sound is heard that is it is a low frequency brief vibration end of the diastole, early diastole when at the end of rapid diastolic filling of the left or the right ventricle okay so s3 sound is heard best at the cardiac apex so this is another important point it can be seen best at the cardiac apex in the left lateral equibitus position okay so the left lateral sideline position we can hear best this s3 heart sound and it has also been termed as ventricular gallop or a proto diastolic gallop okay ventricular or proto diastolic gallop these are the other names so s3 heart sound the type the low frequency brief vibration then s3 heart sound is best heard at apex in the left lateral decubital position we can hear it best and it is also termed as ventricular gallop or post diastolic gallop okay so <clears throat> uh, that's all regarding the s3 heart sound then we will see the other options also so that regarding the s4 heart sound i'll tell you that so rapid filling of the ventricle causes vasodilation that is auscultated as s3 that already we have explained so increased atrial contraction or systemic hypertension can result in the fourth heart sound okay so s4 can be heard at the time of increased atrial contraction or in case of systemic hypertension and aortic valve for malformation that is another option what i have given so that aortic valve malfunction is heard as murmurs okay so murmurs are also very very important so there are different types of murmurs that you have to refer later these are the additional points what i am giving you uh, to uh, prepare more okay so that's all regarding uh, S3, S4 and uh, a marma, that is aortic valve malformation. Okay. So we'll be seeing uh, the third question in our series. So which among the following laboratory values of serum amylase is suggestive of chronic pancreatitis? So the question is regarding chronic pancreatitis and the relationship between serum amylase. Okay. So, uh, the options are option number A, 45 units per liter, option number B, 100 units per liter, option number C, 300 units per liter and option D, 500 units per liter. So, you should know what is the relationship between serum amylase and pancreatitis, then acute and chronic pancreatitis and the normal values of serum amylase. Okay. So, the application level question, but you will get a lot of information from this question. So, we will see the answer first. So, the answer for this question is 300 units per liter. Okay, 300 units per liter. So, we will have a small explanation. So, amylase is an enzyme that helps digest the carbohydrates that you know very well. So, it is made primarily in the pancreas and the glands that make saliva and can be found at low levels in other parts of the body also. So, mainly it is produced by pancreas then in the saliva that you know and some other parts of the body also. Okay, so when the pancreas is diseased or inflamed, it releases increased increased amounts of amylase into the blood okay so don't be confused when there is a disease in the pancreas like inflammation or infection whatever it is so that time serum amylase release into the blood will be more so definitely serum amylase values will be increased in pancreatitis okay so the normal serum pancreas serum amylase level is 25 to 151 units per liter okay so normal serum amylase value is 25 to 151 units per liter so with chronic cases of pancreatitis the rise in the serum amylase level usually does not exceed three times the normal value okay so it does not exceed more than three times of the normal value okay so it will be less than more than three times of the normal serum amylase values but in acute pancreatitis the values may exceed five times the normal value okay so the normal value we know that it is 25 to 151 so in acute pancreatitis it can increase five times the normal value and in chronic cases of pancreatitis it can exceed maximum up to three times okay so that is the difference between chronic and acute pancreatitis and the relationship between serum amylase okay so i think you got a very good explanation for this question and you are getting so many answers for other questions also okay so uh 
<coughs> Another one important mark, uh, thing also I will tell you, serum amylase remains the most commonly used biochemical marker for the diagnosis of acute pancreatitis. Okay, so just an additional information. Okay, so we will be moving on to the fourth question in our series. So the question is during the first 24 hours post colostomy, which of the following observations about the stoma is abnormal? Okay, so this is regarding the abnormal findings in a colostomy after 24 hours, abnormal finding. Okay. So the options are option number A, pink color, option number B, light edema, option number C, small amount of oozing and option number D, trickles of bright red blood. So I have given four options in this one option is abnormal for a colostomy post 24 hours. Okay, 24 hours post colostomy. So what is abnormal? So the answer is option number D, that is trickles of bright red blood. Okay, so we know that after the creation of a colostomy, expect to see a stoma that is pink. So the stoma will be there, that will be pink and slightly edematous. So slight edema is acceptable with some sort of oozing. So oozing, small oozing, slight edema and pink colored stoma. All these things are normal post colostomy 24 hours. So a normal stoma is moist and pink or a red color. Okay. So, but bright red blood, regardless of the amount indicates bleeding and it should be reported. Okay. So bright red blood means there is a bleeding and that is abnormal and that need to be reported. But pink or red colored moist stoma is normal. Okay. Bright red blood means that is hemorrhage. Okay. Bleeding. That means that has to be uh, reported. Okay. Then the inner surface of the stoma continually produces mucus to cleanse the stoma. So this is a normal mechanism and the mucus production, it is a normal function of the intestine that serves as the natural lubrication for the food passing through the body. So the mucus gives the healthy stoma a wet appearance. Okay, so I have explained in the previous slide that uh, it will be wet. So how it will become wet and what is that function and who is doing that, that is explained in this slide. Okay, so that's all regarding the colostomy appearance after post 24 hours. Okay, now moving on to the fifth question in our series. So when weaning the client from the tracheostomy tube, how long the nurse initially should plug the opening in the tube? So don't be confused with the ventilator weaning. So here the question is regarding the tracheostomy tube weaning. That means that a patient has to restore the normal physiological respiration as like normal individuals. Okay. So here the so the weaning the client from the tracheostomy tube, how long the nurse initially should plug the opening in the tube? So the options are option number A, 15 to 60 seconds. Option number B, 5 to 20 minutes. Option number C, 30 to 40 minutes and option number D 45 to 60 minutes. So how long initially we can plug the tube? So what is the answer? So the answer is option number B that is 5 to 20 minutes. 5 to 20 minutes. So we'll have a small explanation regarding this question. Tracheostomy weaning means what? It is a process that gradually uh, returns the airflow to the upper airway and restores the normal physiological functions. So the goal is to remove the tracheostomy and enable the patient to breath unaided without any help with the machine or whatever it is. Okay. So the weaning process involves mainly three steps. That is a cuff deflection. First, we have to deflect the cuff, then a restitution of the supraglottic airway and finally decannulation. So this restitution of the supraglottic airway can be achieved through several steps. I am not going in depth into that. So these are the main three steps in the weaning process of the tracheostomy. Okay, tracheostomy 2. So initially the nurse should plug the opening in the tracheostomy tube for 5 to 20 minutes. That is the answer for our question and then gradually lengthen its interval according to the client's respiratory status. Then what about the other options? A client who doesn't require continuous mechanical ventilation already is breathing without assistance. So at least for short periods, therefore, the plugging the opening of the tube for only 15 to 60 seconds wouldn't be long enough to reveal the client's true tolerance to the procedure. So if the time is very long, then we can't know whether how much the patient can tolerate. Okay. At the same time, plugging the opening for more than 20 minutes would increase the risk of acute respiratory distress because the client requires an adjustment period to start the breathing normally. Okay. So two more or two less is harm. So whatever normal, what I have explained is 5 to 20 minutes. Okay. So that's all regarding a brief explanation regarding that question. Now uh, we can see <coughs> uh, the sixth question in this series. So the question is which among the following a client who discontinues prednisone 
abruptly may experience okay so here the question is asked about the complication that can happen if we stop the prednisolone uh, treatment for a patient abruptly okay abrupt stoppage of prednisolone can, can cause which problems so the options are option number a hyperglycemia and glycosuria option number b acute adrenocortical insufficiency option number c gi bleeding and option number d restlessness and seizures so what is the answer prednisolone steroid so the answer is option number b that is acute adrenocortical insufficiency how so that will be explaining now so administration of a corticosteroid such as a prednisone suppresses the body's natural cortical cortisol secretion okay so because of prednisone the, the body's natural cortisol secretion will be suppressed and it may take weeks or months to normalize after the dis drug discontinuation okay so a gradual reduction in the prednisone dosage gives the adrenal glands in our body some time to resume their usual function so this is the normal thing what we have to follow okay so generally the dose tapering is required for patients who have received more than 40 milligram of prednisolone per day for more than one week so this is the uh, practice that we have to follow so if a patient is receiving prednisolone 40 mg per day for more than a week then prednisolone dosage should be tapered and then it should be stopped okay so upper discontinuation of such therapy may cause the serum cortisol level to drop low enough to trigger the acute adrenocortical insufficiency okay so there should not be uh, abrupt stoppage of the uh, tablet uh, of this medicine because it can result in the acute adrenocortical insufficiency okay so that's all uh, uh, regarding that uh, sixth question now uh, we will be uh, seeing the seventh question so we'll be seeing the next seventh question in this series and the question is the nurse should assess for cyanosis by inspecting which part of the client's skin which part if the client's skin is skin's complexion is dark so the question is regarding if the client is dark skin's complexion where will you look for the cyanosis so the options are option number a lips and option number b mucous membrane option number c nail buds and option number d ear loops so where you will be looking for cyanosis if the patient's skin color is dark so what is the answer <clears throat> so the answer for this question is option number b that is a mucous membrane so why so you know that the skin color it does not affect the mucous membranes but the lips nail buds and ear lobes are less reliable indicators of cyanosis because they are affected by the patient's skin color okay and some more information cyanosis it is an abnormal bluish discoloration of the skin and the mucous membrane so in the dark skinned people the cyanosis may be appear as a bluish tint of the conjunctiva or the palms, then a grayish white color around the lips or the tongue, then maroon color tinge to the nail buds and bluish discoloration of the skin. So these are the findings what we can see in dark colored persons, but mainly we will be looking for the mucous membrane because that is not affected by the person's skin complexion. Okay then some more information uh, so uh, for certain signs and symptoms we have to see for the some colors of the parts of the organs okay so like that three options are like cyanosis pallor and jaundice so cyanosis already we have explained we have to look for the conjunctiva palm soles oral mucosa and tongue then for pallor we have to inspect the sclera conjunctiva oral mucosa tongue lips nail buds palms and soles and for the jaundice, we should inspect for the sclera and the hard palate. Okay, so these are the areas of the skin or the or other parts of the organ. We, what we are looking for certain signs and symptoms, and I think that is clear. So along with that, you should understand two terms: that is a cyanosis and pallor. So what is the difference between that? That also I am just explaining. So cyanosis already we have explained it is a bluish discoloration of the tissues, and why it occurring means because of the less oxygen which is bound to the hemoglobin of the RBCs. Then what is a pallor? Pallor is an unusual lightness of the skin color compared with the normal complexion. So it may be caused by a reduced blood flow and oxygen or by decreased number of red blood cells. Okay. So there are some difference between cyanosis and pallor. So these are, this is in brief or, or a periphery of what is the difference between cyanosis and the 
parallel okay i think uh, that question is clear for you uh, now we will be moving on to the eighth question in our series so the question is which type of diet a patient with stage 4 chronic kidney disease should follow so which diet should be followed by a stage 4 chronic kidney disease patient so the options for you are option number a low protein low sodium low potassium low phosphate diet so that is option number one then option number b high protein low sodium low potassium high phosphate diet option number c low protein high sodium high potassium high phosphate diet and the final option low protein low sodium low potassium high phosphate diet so slightly confusing but it's a very easy question because chronic kidney disease what all electrolyte imbalances will happen that you know very well so if you know that then you can answer this question very easily and the option number a is the answer for this question so the patient should take low protein low sodium low potassium low phosphate diets okay so we will have a small explanation regarding the dietary requirements during uh, stage for kidney disease so first of all we will see regarding the protein so half of the protein should come from high quality sources there should be protein restriction will be there but whatever protein they are taking in that half of the protein should come from high quality sources that provide all the essential amino acids that egg, uh, high quality protein example is egg milk poultry seafood red meats soy etc so this lower the protein diet is thought to have a protective effect on the kidneys okay so that's all regarding the protein requirement then comes the important thing that is a sodium so the national kidney foundation recommends that people with ckd and hypertension limit their sodium intake to less than 2.4 gram in a day okay it should be 2.4 gram or lesser than that based upon the condition of the patient so this is the recommendation by the national kidney foundation so that's all about the sodium so then comes the potassium so we they should take less than 3 gram of potassium in a day less than 3 gram of potassium in a day so phosphate for potassium low diet they have to take and they have their recommended is 300 mg or 3 gram okay then uh, in general the patient should follow this type of diet because protein breaks down into urea so you just remember that the patient will have increased urea levels so low sodium to prevent the fluid excess so why low sodium this is to prevent the fluid excess and low potassium to prevent hyperkalemia and uh, you have to remember that glomerulus is not filtering out the potassium or the phosphate as it should okay so that is not happening so there is a chances for hyperkalemia and hyperphosphatemia and low phosphate diet should be given to prevent hyperphosphatemia okay so these are the reasons what we have given why they have to follow such a strict diet okay so i think from this question you are getting again some more information you are getting about the stage for kidney diseases and its uh, dietary management okay so that's all regarding the eighth question now we'll be seeing uh, the ninth question in our series so what intervention should the nurse implement for a client diagnosed with rectocele so here the question is regarding rectocele and <clears throat> what intervention the nurse should implement so first of all you should understand what is rectocele so that we will be explaining so before that we will see the options option number a limit the oral intake to decrease voiding option number b encourage a low residue diet then option number c administer a stool softener daily and final option arrange for six bath so rectocele what is rectocele then come to the point so the answer for this question is option number c that is administering a stool softener daily stool softener daily why so we'll be seeing now so in gynecology a rectocele otherwise known as the posterior vaginal wall prolapse rectocele otherwise known as the posterior vaginal wall prolapse it results when the rectum bulges into the vagina okay or herniates into the vagina so 
uh, erectosil it is a type of prolapse okay so where the supportive wall of tissue between the rectum and the vaginal wall weakens and without the support of this pelvic floor muscles and ligaments there the front wall of the rectum sags and bulges into the vagina and in severe cases it protrudes out of the vaginal opening okay so that is what is happening in the rectocele so what is the role of stool stool softeners so stool softeners are laxatives which are used to prevent and to treat constipation which is common with rectocele so constipation is very very common with rectocele so because of the position of the rectum the stool can stay in the rectal pouch constant constipation and thereby causing the complications and discomfort to the patient so to prevent that the role of stool softness is very very important okay so uh, that's all about the rectal seal and the, uh, its management so then the comes the 10th question in our series high pitched gurgles heard over the right lower quadrant r dash so here the question is regarding a particular bowel sound so this bowel sound is of what thing okay so high pitched gurgles so this is a characteristics high pitched gurgles heard over the right lower quadrant so the options are option number a it is a sign of increased bowel motility option number b a sign of decreased bowel motility then option number c this is a normal bowel sound and option number d it's a sign of bowel obstruction so high pitched gurgle so that is the characteristics of the sound high pitched gurgle so what is the answer so the answer is option number c that is an it is a normal bowel sound so in the explanation we will be seeing about the normal bowel sound and some abnormal bowel sounds which can be heard in some disease conditions so <coughs> normal bowel sounds these are gurgling or clicking noises that can be heard throughout the day so these sounds are caused by the peristaltic activity okay so why these sounds are causing this is because of peristaltic activity so then remember about this term borborygmus so what is a borborygmus it is a loud prolonged gurgling noise caused by the gas or a liquid moving through the bubble okay so this is also sometimes it is normal so this is a prolonged loud gurgling sound which can be heard in between because of the gas or the liquid which is moving through the bubble so the normal bubble sounds can be heard without a stethoscope and they can be estimated to be normal active hypoactive or hyperactive okay so this can be normal normal active hypoactive and hyperactive so normal active bowel sounds we can hear at around 5 to 30 bowel sounds can be heard per minute or about two sounds every 5 seconds okay two sounds every 5 seconds so this is in short about the normal bowel sounds <clears throat> then uh, i have told there will be hyperactive and hypoactive so hyperactive sounds indicate increased bowel motility okay so two or three sounds per minute indicate decreased bowel motility okay so <clears throat> two or two two to three sounds means that is a decreased bowel sound decreased bowel motility so abdominal cramping with hyperactive high pitched tinkling bowel sound can indicate a bowel obstruction so this is a fourth option what i have given so in bowel obstruction what sound can be heard is abdominal cramping will be there along with that hyperactive high pitched tinkling bowel sound can be heard in bowel obstruction okay so the other conditions also you can refer that also can be asked for the uh, exam so these are the hints what i am giving for you to prepare well okay so that's all regarding the 10th question moving on to the 11th question in our series a simple question in this series during a romberg test the nurse asks the patient to assume which position so to answer this question you should first understand what is a romberg test so the options we will be seeing now option number a sitting position option number b standing position option number c genu pectoral and option number d trend lumbar so which position you will test for a romberg test easy question 
so the answer is option number b that is a standing standing position okay very easy question romberg's test or the romberg sign or the romberg manual it is a test which is used in an exam of neurological function for the balance okay so the exam is based on the premise that a person requires at least two of the three following senses to maintain the balance while standing okay so first one is the proprioception the next one is the vestibular function and the final one is the vision okay so these three domains are being tested so proprioception means the ability to know one's own body positions and the space then vestibular function means the ability to know one's head position in the space and the vision which can be used to monitor and just for changes in the body position okay so <clears throat> these three domains are checked in the rhombus test or the rhombus sign and the patient should be standing all the time for this test so the three things are proprioception vestibular function and the vision okay so <clears throat> that's all regarding that question uh before that that during a robot test which evaluate for the sensory or the cerebellar attacks here the patient must stand with the feet together and arms resting at the sides okay feet together and arms resting at the sides and first with the eyes open and then with eyes closed okay so this is the <coughs> way robot test is being done okay so we will be seeing the 12th question in our series blood pressure readings taken with small to size cuff may do which of the following so if the cuff size is smaller to the size of the particular patient then how the blood pressure readings will be affected so that's a question so the options are option number a fail to show the changes in the blood pressure then next is the produce a false high measurement then next is the next option number c cause arterial or nerve damage and final option is produce a false low measurement so the options are there will not be any difference in the changes in the blood pressure second option is false high measurement third option is cause arterial or nerve damage and the final option is a false low measurement so what is the answer blood pressure readings taken with small to size cuff so the answer for this question is option number b that is it produces a false high measurement if you are using a small to size cuff okay so we will have a small explanation so using an undersized blood pressure cuff produces a falsely elevated blood pressure because the cuff cannot uh, record the brachial artery measurements unless it is uh, properly inflated okay that is excessively inflated so a cuff that is too large can give falsely low readings okay so undersized cuff it can uh, uh, result in the falsely elevated readings and a cuff that is too large can give falsely low reading okay so these two points you please keep in mind and some more additional information i am giving you uh, that the american heart association recommends that the bladder length of a blood pressure cuff should be 80% of the patient's arm okay so 80 patients 80% uh, of the patient's arm need to be covered with the blood pressure cuff okay so this is the recommendation by american heart association and one more information you can see now this is the size recommended size for people according to their age like the small adult it should be 12 into 22 centimeters so for the adult it should be 16 into 30 centimeters for large adults it should be 16 into 36 centimeter and extra large adults it should be 16 into 42 centimeters okay so this is the recommended cuff size according to the age group okay so uh, with this question you are getting nearly four points uh, this uh, these four points in addition to that if you are using the small to size cuff and large to to cuff, uh, cuff so what will be the read, uh, readings okay so i think that is clear now we will move on to the 13th question in our series so uh, this is from the foundations of nursing and uh, the question is the four main concepts common to nursing that appear in each of the current conceptual models are so there are several nursing theory models so in the first year you have we have learned all about this so this is regarding the four main concepts which are 
present in the current conceptual models okay so the options are person nursing environment and medicine option number b person health nursing support system option number c person health psychology nursing and the final option person environment health and nursing so which are the four main current con um, concepts in the current conceptual models so this is a basic question from foundations and the answer is option number d that is a person environment health and nursing okay a small explanation so the focus concepts that have been accepted by all the theorists are the focus of nursing practice from time of florence nightingale which include the person receiving the nursing care his environment his health on the health illness continuum and the nursing actions which are necessary to meet his needs okay so these are the main four concepts okay the, the focus is on these four concepts okay so uh, with that we will be moving on to the second last question in this series so the question is a lethargic post tonsillectomy patient will be placed in which therapeutic position okay so the key points are the patient is lethargic and the next point is post tonsillectomy so think about first one is a lethargic then next is the tonsillectomy patient so which position you will be keeping post surgery so the options are option number a semi fowler's position option number b supine position option number c high fowler's position and option number d lateral decubitus position so which position you will place the client after a post tonsillectomy procedure and the patient is lethargic also so these points will uh, guide you to select the option uh, that is the answer for this question is option number d that is the lateral decubitus position okay lateral decubitus is the answer for this question so because of lethargy the post tonsillectomy client is at risk for aspirating the blood from the surgical wound so the placing the client in the sideline position until he awake is best so the semi fowlers or the supine or the high fowlers position don't allow for the adequate oral drainage in a lethargic post tonsillectomy client and increases the risk of blood aspiration and related complications okay so that is the reason why we have to keep the patient in the uh, side lying position okay so the lateral position which is also known as the lateral decubitus position or the lateral recumbent position and the word lateral means to the side while the recumbent means lying down okay so the side lying position we have to give for lethargic patients after the surgery especially for the tonsillectomy because the blood drainage from the wound can be drained out very easily okay so that's all regarding the 13th question now uh, we are going to see the second last question in this series sorry the last the final question in our series so the question is in the screen right now which among the following diet will be advised for patient receiving furosemide so this question is regarding a drug that is a furosemide that patient is receiving so what diet you will be advising for this patient okay so the options for you are option number a white rice and bread option number b bananas and oranges option number c lean red meat option number d creamed corn so which will you will be advising for a patient receiving furosemide so just think about what is furosemide so you know that furosemide it is a diuretic and it is a what type of diuretic then you can come to the answer for this question so i think uh, you have got some information about this question so the answer for this question is option number b that is a bananas and oranges why that we will be seeing now uh, so the answer for this question uh, uh, that uh, explanation we will see now so furosemide it is a loop diuretic medication okay so which is used to treat the edema due to heart failure liver scaring or kidney disease okay so th this is the indications for the furosemide so it is a loop diuretic so it is recommended that the serum electrolytes of the patients especially potassium need to be monitored along with creatine and bun levels okay so as well as monitoring of the liver and kidney functions are also very very important while patient is on furosemide so we will be coming to the answer for our question so because furosemide is a potassium wasting diuretic okay so the nurse should plan to teach the patient 
to increase the intake of potassium rich foods such as bananas and oranges so the other options like bread rice red meat and creamed corn are not good sources of potassium so the other complications or the common side effects of the furosemide injection include hypokalemia that is the low potassium level then hypotension that is low blood pressure and dizziness so uh, hypokalemia the reason already i have explained because of the potassium wasting property hypotension because of the fluid loss as a result of diuresis and followed by dizziness also is a common side effect of the furosemide okay so that also it was a little applicable type question but uh, very informative so with that we are coming to the end of the session so we have discussed nearly 15 questions from various aspects and we have given some little weightage to the neurological and psychiatric questions because of nimhan's examination so hope you uh, you got uh, some information and some usefulness regard, uh, uh, with this video so we are just signing out now so keep in touch with us and you will be notified uh, when our next video will come so till that time good night